Beckett back a few months ago at resale. Um, several of you challenged me to actually wear it um, on Sunday, especially on near the 4th of July, and so I decided to accept that challenge, accept that dare, and go ahead and wear it. Um, I'm sorry if you can't quite see me because the, you know, pattern, it's got that Johnny Carson thing where his jackets used to dance on TV. I'm sorry if that's going on, um, but whatever it is, um, you'll know at least why I'm doing it. I, I, I do have a sense of humor after all. Um, I want to say before my sermon as well that I was very tempted today to completely rework my sermon or just flat out write a new one after um, the news broke yesterday of the death of Elie Wiesel. Um, Elie Wiesel, of course, is an author and activist for peace, a survivor of the Holocaust, and a man who has helped all of us in the Western world remember what the Holocaust really meant, what the suffering of the Jews was in the Holocaust, and how that cast a pall over all of Western theology, Western thought, Western politics, um, how the Holocaust challenged our cultures to their very core. And Elie Wiesel, for the last five decades, has done an amazing job of refusing to let us forget what the Holocaust was all about and what it means for us today. I decided not to rewrite this sermon and go into all of that because I didn't trust myself to be able to do it do justice. I'm going to come back to that at some point, probably later this summer. The witness that was Elie Wiesel, the message of hope that I believe is ultimately proclaimed in his life, but um, that's that's going to take some more time to work out. And then because we don't have normal prayers on Sunday when we celebrate communion, I wanted also to mention and acknowledge that just on Friday we had the funeral for the death of Michael Brindley, um, the 16-year-old from our congregation who died um, 10 days ago, 11 days ago now and uh, encourage you all to remember the Brindley family in your prayers to uh, keep Christy and Bob and all the rest um, in your thoughts and prayers and any little tangible signs of love and support you want to send them I'm sure would be uh, continue to be greatly appreciated. Now for the sermon proper. Um, one of the big mistakes that Christianity has fallen into over the years is the idea that Jesus represents some big, decisive, dramatic change from the Judaism that came before him. That he represents a big, decisive, dramatic change from the Judaism in which he was raised, which shaped him which made him who he was. This is sometimes expressed as the idea, and I know that many of you struggle with this, this is sometimes expressed with the idea that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament seem so different that they just couldn't really be the same God. One vengeful, violent, and distant, the other loving, gracious and near at hand. The problem with this idea is that it is such an oversimplification of both the Old Testament and the New. It's a caricature of the God that's revealed to us in both parts of the Bible. The God who is much more complicated than either of those caricatures reveal. The truth is that very little about Jesus 
was entirely new. The stories of the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, those stories are what made him who he was. Jesus trusted in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Exodus, delivery from slavery in Egypt, the God of King David, the God of the prophets Elijah and Elisha that we heard about today, the God of the exile in Babylon when the people were a thousand miles from home and their civilization destroyed. Christians trust in the God of Jesus, who is the God of the Jews. Of course, there is something new about Jesus, but it's not new content, really. It's rather new emphasis. One way to think about these things is that the Old Testament can be seen like a, like a, a complex cloth, you might say. Or even better, think of it this way, as a friendship bracelet. Does everybody know what a friendship bracelet is? Probably your grandkids, maybe, or kids have seen these. Um, so they start out with several strings of thread, and then you weave the strings together in such a certain way that it makes a little bracelet that your friend, as a sign of friendship, can wear. Well, what Jesus does is take apart those strands and recombine them in a new way. A way that brings different strands to the fore in the design of the bracelet. He brings different strands and colors to make them more visible. It's the same threads, the same colors, and yet, it's also something new. So today's reading from 2 Kings is a perfect example of the type of strand from the Old Testament that Jesus picks out from the ancient stories of his people and emphasizes anew. You heard the story, I don't think I need to repeat it, just the most important part for my purpose today is not what happened, the fact that Naaman was healed of his disease. It's not how it happened, the fact that Elisha didn't even bother to come to the door, but just told this grand general with all of his horses and chariots waiting outside, just don't go wash in the river, you'll be fine. The important thing is who he healed. The man healed of his skin disease is Naaman. And Naaman is the commander of the Syrian army. And Syria is the enemy of Israel. At the time of Elisha, Syria to the north and Israel a little bit further south in what is today still modern Israel and actually where modern Syria is today as well, those two countries battled for control of land and resources, each claiming, you won't be surprised to hear, each claiming that their own God fought on their side and would give them the victory in this ongoing battle. You know, just to kind of cut to the chase here, this is like, you know, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. Thought I could say it. Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, coming to Hinsdale Hospital for help, being healed, and heading back to Syria to carry on his war. This is God, through Elisha, showing love for the enemy. You have to let the emotional impact of that sink in. It's terrible in many ways. 
If it doesn't sting a little, you're probably not being honest with yourself. The horrendous crimes of ISIS, the beheadings, the mutilations, the systemic rape, some of it shown in full living color on the internet, horrors straight out of the Middle Ages. It's sickening. And that guy comes for help and walks away healed. It's no wonder that when 800 years after Elisha, when Jesus reminds people of this story at the beginning of the New Testament, people immediately want to throw him off a cliff. It's no wonder that the guy who emphasizes this story, of all the stories in the Old Testament, the guy who emphasizes this story ends up executed without a single follower remaining. When Jesus said, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, he wasn't coming up with some brilliant new teaching, some revolutionary idea of God. He was choosing to highlight this story, this strand of the story that had been there for hundreds of years. He was saying, come on, be old school people. Love your enemy. Now, I've been thinking about this sermon for several months, ever since I realized that this passage was going to show up in the lectionary on the day before Independence Day. Of course, we gather together every Sunday to worship God because it is the day each week when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we remember who we are as Christ's disciples. We do not gather today because it is Independence Day Eve, but because it is the Lord's Day, the eighth day of creation in which God recreates the world through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Still, the truth is, of course, that while disciple names the most important thing about us, American names another part of who we are. And 240 years ago, tomorrow, as we normally declare, the nation in which we live was born. Now many of you already know, in spite of my jacket and tie today, that I am not the guy who's going to give a rah, rah, yay, America sermon. Because of my convictions about Jesus Christ and my understanding of what the church should be about in the world today, I'm not just not sure what to make of the United States of America on our 200th and 40th birthday. I'm not sure what to make of it on our 240th birthday. The truth is that there is much about this country that disturbs me. In general, we are way too focused on our stuff. So much that we seem to be defined often by what we buy. And this kind of consumerism is killing us. In many ways, literally. In general, we fail to acknowledge the tragedy of war as we are reminded again today after the death of Elie Wiesel. We fail to acknowledge the tragedy of war, celebrating and romanticizing victory while failing to acknowledge that the beginning of every armed conflict marks our failure to make peace. And in general, our political system leaves us unable to deal responsibly with long-term problems. And so, as is so obvious, especially in the state of Illinois right now, we end up pursuing more or less popular short-term fixes rather than commit to unpopular but absolutely necessary long-term solutions. But, 
there is much about this country that I absolutely love as well. In general, we are a creative and innovative people, constantly putting things together in new ways to solve problems and make the future better, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. In general, we are a wonderfully diverse and tolerant people. The United States, because of the great history of immigration that covers our full 240 years, is an amazingly diverse country. And it's a beautiful thing to behold. We tend to live and let live. And although, of course, there are sometimes individual variations to that that end up in terrible attacks and murders as we've recently seen in Orlando, still, in general, we live and let live no matter how different we are from each other. Beautifully sung by Ryan a few minutes ago. And in general, on an individual basis, although maybe not so much on a governmental basis, we are incredibly generous people. The average across the population as individuals, Americans give more money to charity than just about any people on the face of the earth. But the great problem with all of this, both the good and the bad, is that it's very hard to see how any of it actually sort of directly relates to being American. The words of the Declaration of Independence probably serve more than any other to define us as Americans, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all, of course, the original says men, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it's not at all clear how the things that I mentioned earlier, the good and the bad, relate to that Declaration of Independence. Does the right to liberty that we so cherish lead to the celebration of war? Or does it lead to our wonderfully tolerant spirit? Or in some way to both? Does the right to pursue happiness lead to our consumerism? Or to our generosity? or perhaps to both. I don't really think there's any way to settle the question of what it means to be American and whether that is a good or bad thing. So for the most part, I just join with everybody else in celebrating the good stuff on a day like tomorrow, enjoy the fireworks, and then spend the other days trying to figure out how best to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ in America. But let me say that a little more strongly. You know, it's hard to celebrate ambivalence about America. I am proud to say firmly and with conviction that I don't really know what to make of this place. But I actually think that that's the right position for us to take as disciples of Jesus Christ in the United States of America. Our job as Christians is not to pledge allegiance to the flag, nor to wish it ill. Our job as Christians, rather, is to go about living in America as people who are shaped by a different story. A story that reveals to us that we find real life, full life, when we love our enemies. I don't think we need to come to some 
final grand conclusion about our national identity. We don't need to worry about living in a frustrating land of ambiguity because we already have solid ground for our existence. We already have a way to go, a path forward, an identity that claims us. We already have a God to worship on the fourth day of July and every other day of the year. It's the God known to us in Jesus of Nazareth. We can be engaged in the life of this country, celebrating and challenging and working hard each and every day to make it a better place, especially for the vulnerable, exactly because our highest citizenship is not of this place, but is of the kingdom of God. Now, some of you give me feedback after sermons like this. And you're going to have the chance to do that in a few minutes, out on the patio, following the service. Some of you give me feedback after sermons like this when I try to lay out what may be a new or at least um, renewed, challenging perhaps, way of thinking about things, what it means to be an American and a Christian at the same time. You often wonder, okay then, Mike, and you ask me, what am I supposed to do? What does this mean for my everyday life? Well, I know it's frustrating, but my answer is that I can't tell you exactly what it means for you in your life. What I can tell you is that this is a wonderful country. I love living here. I love returning here when I've been in Angola or in other places where there aren't the basic freedoms, the basic openness, the basic tolerance that we have. I love living here. But when I pledge allegiance, it is to a strange God. A God who heals the commander of the Syrian army, my enemy. So what are you supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? The way I see it is if we get our allegiance right, the rest will fall into place. The truth is that most of you are already doing the things that we are called to do. You have been shaped by, in some way, shape, or form, by this Christian story. And yet, I think it is helpful to draw out the parts that Jesus drew out. To reshape you might say, the bracelet that is the American story, to turn it once again into the Christian story, to highlight new things about God and faith and love. Because when you get that allegiance right, the rest falls into place so that we can be the people that God calls us to be as well as be Americans at the same time. So indeed, as every political speech ends, God bless America. And God bless us as disciples of Jesus Christ as we seek to live faithfully in America. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.